Hello and welcome to the Life After Diets podcast. I'm Sarah Dosanj, psychotherapist and author of the book, I Can't Stop Eating. And I'm Stephanie Michelle, binge recovery health coach. If you feel out of control around food, we get it because we've been there. Thank you for joining our conversations about how to make peace with food and feel more comfortable in our bodies. Now on to this week's episode. Before we begin, I'd just like to take a moment of your time to let you know that if you are listening to this episode around the time of its release, our next live event is going to be this Sunday, the 27th of February, 2022. Steph and I have this shared vision of creating a community where people can come and share stories and recover from disordered eating. And we have really enjoyed connecting with many of you at our previous events. If you are listening to this after the 27th of February, we are planning to continue doing these events on a regular basis, and we really hope to connect with many more of you. Okay, let's move on with the episode. We're we're going in a little bit of a different direction today. We're Mm -hmm. talking about we're talking about Janine Roth, but we're not talking to her. Just to clarify (laughs) for anyone who's come here (laughs) with bated breath, waiting for Janine to show up, she's not coming. Um, but we are having a conversation about Janine Roth because she's been such an influential figure in this realm. I think she's like the OG Mm -hmm. (laughs) on diet perspective. Um, and we've decided to maybe have some conversations about influential figures in this space or Mm -hmm. people who have influenced us. Um, so we're going to see how this goes. Mm -hmm. How how are you feeling? Sarah? Good. Well, this came off the back of a listener request and it was a question actually rather than a quest they wanted to know what we thought about self-help yeah and that got us thinking and self-help I don't like the phrase because it has all kinds of connotations but there have been so many exactly like you say influential figures concepts ideas that I have heard from other people that I've had to apply myself mm. uh, shared before I didn't really recover from my binge eating until I stopped going to therapy (laughs) same actually Mm. because the therapy I was going to was nothing to do I say nothing to do with binge eating I talked about it a lot but my therapist didn't know anything about binge eating so I felt like I was going round and round in circles so it was helpful in many ways in increasing my self-awareness and working on the black and white thinking but ultimately when it came to healing my relationship with food it's people like Ginny and Roth and a few other people that we might talk about over the next year that had the biggest impact on that specific part of my life. Interesting because, well, why don't we, I want to first, for someone who's not familiar with Janine Roth, like she's been around for, I don't know quite how long, but decades at least, mm-hmm. because I actually found her when I was 19. Uh, I started reading her book. She was the only one speaking about compulsive eating, which is the you know, in the title of her books. It, she doesn't quite call it binge eating in any of her book titles, but it's compulsive eating, emotional eating, overeating. And she was, I actually attended some of her retreats back when I was in college. So she's been around for me for a really long time in the back of my mind and has heavily influenced the way that I think about food. But my recovery did not occur until like 20 years later. I I think I used Janine Roth's concepts a lot actively when I was recovering. And we both turned up today with a copy of her book in our hands, (laughs) which wasn't planned. We're both holding a copy of uh, yeah, Women, Food and God, which is the most well-known, I would say, possibly the most popular book that she's written. Yeah. And it was interesting for me picking it up because looking at it, there's quite a few passages I've highlighted and underlined that I would have done back when I was struggling. And so maybe part of what we'll do today is I will share the bits that I underlined and we'll see how they sit with us today because Mm -hmm. I don't feel the same as I did when I first read it, Mm -hmm. but there's so much in there. There's still a lot of what she says that really speaks to my soul. Yeah. Do we want to give like a little background on who she is? Like what she's been through? Yeah, yes. Yeah. I mean, just for anyone unfamiliar with her, she... Um, well, some of the books she's written is When Food is Love, um, How to Break Free from Compulsive Eating, When You, uh, of course, when you eat at the refrigerator, (laughs) at the refrigerator, pull up a chair, um, which one, that one always stuck out in my mind, but she herself, you know, struggled with compulsive eating diet cycles, um, binge eating, binge restrict Mm -hmm. for, um, in the beginning of her life and went through a, 
a, a recovery process that involved allowing herself to eat and gaining weight mm -hmm. um, and has since been writing books and teaching and holding retreats. And um, she's a tour de force in this and has been for quite some time before social media was ever a thing, before anyone else was really I think, talking about it. And she's a speaker and she's now what in her in her 60s and I believe, right? I would say so, yeah. 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 She's also a fabulous writer. Like she, mm -hmm. with the way she writes is uh, just so poetic and um, you just kind of devour the books, no pun intended. Mm -hmm. So part of her story that always sticks in my mind, she talks about how she restricted for two years and by the sounds of it, she was very weight suppressed at that time. Mm -hmm. And then when the restriction, when the control broke, she binged day and night for two months and she reports that she gained 80 pounds in two months mm. Mm. you think well, that's over a pound a day that is some pretty mm. um well that's extreme <laughs> extreme yeah. yeah very extreme the restriction that would have been going on for so long and then she was talking about eating day and night whilst it sounds extreme and big okay. I get it I believe her I'm, I'm pretty yeah. sure that that's that's the way it unfolded and then when she started her recovery journey one of the things that I really love about what she did was she set up these groups yeah. and I'm a massive fan of groups and communities and she invited these people to her house and that's how she started working with people in this space and she wore a moo moo I remember she talks about that <laughs> that went that image always stuck in my head she's like nothing fit but a moo moo so that's what I wore <laughs> to what's, these groups what's a moo moo you don't know what a muumuu is? No. It's like um, like a big robe. It's oh. just like like my grandma had muumuus. It was like it's like just a just a almost like a tent of a robe. It okay. just buttons up and it's just a, a shapeless sort of. <laughs> it's very comfortable. You know, mm -hmm. it's like there's no, it's just a big, roby tenty dress type mm -hmm. thing. Oh, I didn't know that that was a not not a it common knowledge. Um, well, it, it might just be me that hasn't heard no, of it, or I'm no. not sure if it's not a UK thing. I don't know. Maybe, Maybe. You, UK listeners can let me know whether they've heard of mm. it or not. What did you highlight in that book? And and at the at the time when you read it, how long ago was this? And and where were you in the in that point in your process? This would have been about five, four or five years ago, maybe four years ago. Okay. And I was I was letting go of dieting, and then I was being sucked back in and letting go and sucked back in. Is that I call it my semi-recovered state mm. to kind of see what was going on. And I was trying to break the cycle. So this was interesting because when I, and I highlighted it, I read it earlier. There was a bit that I thought maybe I won't even read that out on the podcast. And then I thought, no, I'm going to read the whole thing because we're just going to see how it sits with us. Okay. So this is from um, the chapter titled, Never Underestimate the Inclination to Bolt. Janine Roth writes, Compulsive eating is the way we distance ourselves from the way things are when they are not how we want them to be. I tell them that ending the obsession with food is all about having the capacity to stay in the present moment, to not leave themselves. I tell them that they don't have to make a choice between losing weight and doing this. Weight loss is the easy part. Anytime you truly listen to your hunger and fullness, you lose weight. But I also tell them that compulsive eating is basically a refusal to be fully alive. No matter what we weigh, those of us who are compulsive eaters have anorexia of the soul. We refuse to take in what sustains us. We live lives of deprivation. And when we can't stand it any longer, we binge. The way we are able to accomplish all of this is by the simple act of bolting, of leaving ourselves hundreds of times a day. Um, I've got the same really <laughs> right here you just started it earlier i was going to start talking at, i was going to start talking alongside of you uh which is so interesting that we both got this one <laughs> there was so much i think the biggest message the biggest takeaway for me janine is about this staying with ourselves this exactly. the present moment accepting the present moment that's a huge part of my own journey and the way i think about this problem can you guess the part that I wasn't sure whether I wanted to read on the podcast or not? Well, I think it's a great thing to read because it's the the weight loss. I mean, that anytime you honor your hunger and fullness, that you're going to lose weight, uh, and that that's the easy part. You know, <laughs> I, know <right? laughs> I think it sure. speaks to this is a perfect thing to begin with because this is at the heart of 
my love, and that's not love, hate. I, I love Janine Ross, but my agreement and my divergence from her, her theories. I think that what she says about staying with oneself and that all the soul grabbing pieces of what she says are so true and the staying with oneself and not, so I refer to that, like the self-abandonment and that piece is huge for recovery and has been influential to me. But this other side, which I think she carries and weaves through so much of her writing, whether this is because she was sort of the, an original voice here and didn't, there wasn't so much conversation about weight stigma and body diversity. And I mean, she was such a product of diet culture of the time that there weren't these conversations. So that could be why, but there is a lot of fat phobia weaved in her writing and ideas about weight that I disagree with. And that actually, I think it was that, which is why I read her 20 years ago and, and loved so much. And it helped me so much. And at the same time, I couldn't cross the that threshold of accepting certain things about my body. And that is what held me back. So in her message, um, there was this, I think there was a part of it that set me free and a part of it that held me back because of this exact thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've got a, I wanted to read, I, I actually found a um, couple of journal entries that I'd written. It says, I'm struggling between feeling like, yes, have it Janine Roth style. Allow yourself to eat whatever you want for a period of time so you learn to trust yourself and not feel deprived again. Except the truth is that I'm not willing to gain X amount of pounds to do this. And that's what I know would have to happen first, which was, this was me pre, pre-recovery, um, mm -hmm. kind of in that toggle between, I know this is the right thing, but I'm not willing to gain the weight. Mm -hmm. And that essentially was my stance for many years of like this knowing, but also this unwillingness to breach. And I think part of the way she talks about weight contributes to that because there is this idea that that might be part of the reward you get, mm -hmm. you know, part of if you, if you allow yourself to eat, you'll lose the weight. You'll become that intuitive eater that sheds this baggage when that's not necessarily true. And it wasn't for me. Mm -hmm. I think whether to say this, I might say it and then we'll decide whether to keep it in or not. But when I went to the retreat, it was online. I would say the majority of people who went were in larger bodies Agreed. already. Mm -hmm. So there's something about Janine's message, almost this promise of weight loss. If you do this right, yeah, you will lose weight that I think can be very appealing um, to those people who may be in larger bodies, not trying to minimize. I'm not trying to make sweeping generalizations right. here and try and judge people's motivations based on the size of their body. But that was just something that I happened to notice. And Janine Roth is in a small body. She's a, a slim woman. Yeah. And so I sometimes wonder whether there's something aspirational mm -hmm. about that. Mm. I attended her retreat when I was 19. I was the youngest in the room. And I, I had the same observation of that most of the people there were in larger bodies. And I was in an, a plus size body too. And the weight loss was part of what I believed recovery was. And I think that that message, when you can hold on to that, that's what, <laughs> I mean, that's what, I think that's what sells those tickets, you know, and in, and I, that was also the part that can keep you stranded there and keep you in circles because so much of what she says makes sense. Mm -hmm. So much you can relate to. It just pulls at your heartstrings like, you, like you've like you thought it yourself. You've written it yourself. It's like you're being seen for the first time. And yet there's this undercurrent of that promise that keeps, that can, I think that for me, that's what perpetuated that cycle as, you know, and, and when I found this journal entry, it was like, yeah, that's kind of, that kind of makes sense as to why I was still stuck there. And the difference between reading her and absorbing her material and then finally recovering, where was the departure? And it was in the release of that promise. Because her message is very much don't, don't restrict, don't let yourself go hungry, honor your hunger. But it also, to me, felt like, and I think she explicitly says it, that it's about eating when you're hungry. It feels like her protocol is about only eating when you're hungry. At least that's the message that I absorbed. Yes, and it's interesting because I've been thinking about how she writes and how she explains. And there's a part of me that relates to 
like when she wrote about her restriction and she does explicitly say restriction will cause binging. Um, and in fact, the quote that of hers that stuck with me the longest if, uh, since day one was for every diet, there is an equal and opposite binge. And when I read that, however many years, decades ago, I read it and I was like, cover my eyes. I wish I didn't see that. Like I, because in reading it, I knew it was true. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to believe it was true because it took away. <laughs> it was like, a, it was like a sentence. It was like, oh, and maybe, I don't know. It was true for me. It was like one of those things I read and I knew and I carried it with me. And through every diet I ever went on in those subsequent years, uh, that, that sentence stayed with me like a threat. Um, as good as I felt, you know, when I went on keto and when I lost weight through fasting and the paleo, you know, and all these things that, and I, and then somewhere was like, this isn't the end of the story. There's an equal and opposite binge. And there always was. And I think that she, that message is, is a good one. But I think that after she um, recovered and went on and kind of landed in her now what is now a very petite body, the message became more about that baggage we carry and all of the emotional components of eating that that she starts to, to speak of. And I think she lost some of that, or at least the messaging stopped focusing so much on that reality as, as an equal factor here. And I think it's easy to cling to all that, oh, like my weight is my emotional baggage and all of that. It's easy to cling to that side of the message and kind of forget about the other side. I, I just feel like when she talks about hunger and fullness, it's it's from the vantage point of being able to respect your fullness and honor your hunger more consistently and easily. And I think it misleads people who are not there, which are the people reading her books and devouring her information. It's like you can't you ignore the other piece of where people are in this process. You, they can't just hold on to that emotional side. It's got to also include that trying to diet through hunger and fullness. It's not quite accurate. We hope you're enjoying this episode of the podcast. We just want to take a minute of your time to let you know we're now on Patreon. If you would like to support our work and be a part of our growing community, please head to patreon.com forward slash life after diets. All of our patrons are invited to join us in our Life After Diets private Facebook group to connect with us and other like-minded souls. For more details about how to contact us or to work with Sarah or Steph individually, please check out the show notes. Now let's get back to the episode. I can't think of anywhere where she talks about mental deprivation around food. It's very much physical. There's, there is a lot about the emotions and eating emotionally, but not that idea that cutting out certain foods can increase the desire for those types of foods. I don't hear that. I can't remember hearing that anywhere in her messaging. But this idea of being present with yourself, not abandoning yourself, because for me, binging was such an escape. It was such a mm -hmm. opportunity to numb and soothe and forget about everything for a while. That message was what I needed to hear. So I'll always be grateful mm -hmm. for her for providing that message in such a poetic, well-communicated way. But when we look at the actual challenges of staying with ourselves, I've got another quote that I want to share with you. Yeah. It's about how to stay with your feelings and what happens if you do. And I just want to get your response. Agree, disagree, what does it okay. provoke in you? All any feeling wants is to be welcomed with tenderness. It wants room to unfold. It wants to relax and tell its story. It wants to dissolve like a thousand writhing snakes that with a flick of kindness becomes harmless strands of rope. That is very poetic. She just lures you right in, right? Doesn't she? You, you, I hear that and I think I could feel any feeling now. <laughs> <laughs> shame, what's shame? <laughs> I, I The beginning of that quote sounds, I, I'm, I, I was in agreement with the end sounds like it wraps it up in a bow a little too much for me. It feels like the, the goal of it is to resolve it or to feel it. And then it goes like, it just walks away happy that you just saw it and had a date with it. Like mm -hmm. that actually for me, <laughs> oh, unfortunately it's, it's not as, it's a bit more anticlimactic. What's your take? I've had those moments. So I think I can relate to it to some degree. But I would probably say I've had more times when I've tried to feel something that have not been that. 
I've often heard it described as feelings can't hurt you. Feelings are just feelings. And if you just allow them, they're just uncomfortable sensations in your body and all this minimization of what an emotion is. But in order to surrender into an emotion like this, we have to let go of the story about the feeling. But how do we let go of the story about the feeling when we believe the story? We think mm. it's true. So what, what our feelings tell us feel like the truth. So that remembering that it may not be true, the way I see it, that's the task for me anyway. And I still, even now, keep forgetting. <laughs> Can you give me an example of that? Like, how does that actually look? Okay, so a couple of weeks ago, I had a few days off and I had a really busy few days. I had three nights where I stayed at a different friend's house each night and it was full. Socially, it was absolutely full. And on the Sunday lunchtime, I got back into my own home and I have this thing because I am more extrovert by nature. I often have this experience that when I've been spending time with people and I'm suddenly on my own, I get this feeling that is, it's a type of sadness. And it will happen if I have a lot of people around and there's noise and gathering. And then when everyone goes out the, out of the place and shut the door and there's that silence, that's when this sadness arises. I cannot find a word for it that makes sense because to me, it feels like abandonment. It feels like a loss. It feels like a withdrawal. And it's this really complicated existential feeling that isn't really about that moment because that moment is okay. So only a few weeks ago, I had this and I got home and I sat on the sofa and I, I felt it so strongly, probably because I'd been so filled up by all this social interaction that I sat on the sofa and I just, I wanted to cry. Like I didn't know what to do with myself. And I had the thought of like, oh, I should just go and get myself something really nice to eat for lunch, which I can absolutely do. But it's interesting, again, having that thought when I'm feeling this way. And so I probably sat on the sofa for about half an hour, like wrestling with myself, wrestling with this feeling, not knowing what to do with myself, getting myself more agitated. And then I noticed what I was doing. If I can wake the observing part of me that can see what's happening, it's like the observing part of me can accept that. So I thought, oh, this feels big and this is hurting, whatever this feeling is. I can't get rid of it, so can I accept it? Because it's almost in the getting rid of it, trying to get rid of it, that I keep fighting with myself. When I accept, then I just sat there and had a really good cry for mm. about 15, 20 minutes. I didn't really know what I was crying about. I just know that I felt incredibly sad. But because I allowed it and I stopped having a story and I stopped fighting with this feeling and I let it come through, after I'd had that 15-minute cry, there was just a sense of calmness and everything's okay. Mm. that for me is what she talks about with everything kind of dissolving but it needs the higher part of me to wake up and I have moments where I do that I don't always do that when I'm feeling something I'm feeling some uncomfortable feelings but huh. when I can then I accept it and then it, it it almost dissolves into an illusion it's just a sensation because it was the story the sudden story that is getting ignited by how do I feel this bad? What does it mean that I feel this bad? Mm. It doesn't have to mean anything. And when we let go of the meaning, then it's not as painful when it doesn't mean as much. And I think for me, I can only really experience the emotion, just the emotion, until I recognize that I'm telling myself a story. Once I recognize that there's a story playing out, and the minute I recognize there's a story playing out, now I'm, I don't know if that's true or not. And that's come a lot through doing Byron Katie's work. And we have to do an all about Byron Katie <laughs> one week. That the minute I see I'm telling myself a story, that introduces doubt. And then when I doubt the story, that's when I can get in touch with just the emotion. And I, I don't know if that. What was the story in your situation there? The story was something about why do I feel this bad the minute I'm on my own I can't cope being on my own what's wrong with me all of that that kind of build up was the story around it okay 
And when I recognize, oh, I've gone to that place, I'm telling myself I can't cope if I'm not around people, which I mm. is not necessarily true and isn't true most of the time. It's true as soon as I believe it's true, and then it's not true the minute I don't believe it's That's true. interesting. That's not my story, which is so interesting. We can take the same emotion and make a different story. Mine is that it will last forever, that mm. this is this is my true essence, <laughs> and I will never... There is no relief. This is the reality. This was such a reactive feeling to walking in, in the yeah. house. So it, it had very much been triggered by the situation. So therefore the story was situational. Yeah, yeah. Compared to being able to feel that at another time, I'm sure I have and do, might be different. But yes, there is definitely that story exactly about that's what I am. And it came up when the episode I did where I talked about how I felt when I saw that photograph of myself. Mm -hmm. I could feel all those feelings and see that I was telling myself a story at the same time. Yeah. That's how I could feel all those feelings without immediately rushing to, oh my goodness, everything I yeah. believed is not true. And actually I should go on a diet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it, in, it offers you another choice. I think it's like, mm -hmm. rather than being pulled around on a leash by the story, you get to think maybe the story is not true. And just that choice, just the option. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. I need to bring up another point that I didn't realize I had about Janine Roth until I started um, preparing for this episode, which is that, oh, it is actually, that's why I wrote the quote down that you mentioned before. And then she goes on to say, um, eating is about flattening your life. And in that respect, I remember reading it and being like, yes, yes, it is. I am. I am just, it, it takes the position that food and eating is the enemy and that we're using it in this way that is negative. And I agree with that to an extent in certain situations, but I also fundamentally <laughs> have come to believe that binge eating is also an ally voice that we have. And I don't think that gets enough. I think that Janine pathologizes food so much and, and the compulsive eating so much. Um, I, I have come to think differently. I think that binge eating can be our voice. I think that binge eating can sometimes be a way that we stand up for ourselves and that we speak. And when I think about this, it's like the desire to eat is a sign that we're alive. When we don't want to eat anymore, this is actually a sign of, you know, that we're not thriving. And so when I think about binge eating specifically, there's something about that that makes me feel like that there's someone there with a fire, that there's a fire burning somewhere. And it's perhaps it's being misguided. It's not being expressed in its most productive form, but that there's something about it that means that we have something to say and we're maybe not saying it, or we have a boundary and we're maybe not advocating for it. And that there's a voice inside that is begging to be expressed. And to me, there's something hopeful about that. And there's something invigorating about that. And while it's, not, again, it's like, okay, can we reroute the actual voice and the actual allyship into a different direction? Yes. But there's something more positive about binge eating that I fundamentally believe in. When I have clients who come to me and I, you know how you just, like, they'll describe the way they are and you, you see their essence or their character and their strength that in a way that they do not. And you're, it's like, this is, we just need to channel this. Like it's, there's something in here that's alive in you. And that's a piece of binge eating that I don't think gets talked about. I love that. It reminded me of when I first started working with eating disorders as a therapist, making that decision to just work with binge eating, the thought process, it was something like there is such a life force, I think was the words I used behind binge mm -hmm. eating. Whereas the restriction anorexia, the real restriction and deprivation is that sh more of shutting off and flattening the life force right. than binge eating. It's like there is a part of you mm -hmm. that wants to live that it yep. is not going to allow itself to be controlled. And absolutely. And I experienced that just in how a client would present in the room when they are restricting and depriving and when they've got this binge eating, that boy, they hate the binge eating, but this force in them is so much stronger than even their conscious control. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. When we're talking about permission to eat, I think mm -hmm. here's another quote from Janine. She says, if you actually listen to what your body, not your mind, wants, 
you'll discover it doesn't want three weeks of hot fudge sundaes, despite the panting and salivating that is evoked at their very mention. In addition to your body's need for foods other than ice cream and fudge, there is also the fact that the moment you tell yourself you can have it, the moment the taboo is removed, hot fudge sundaes become as ordinary as sardines. <laughs> I don't think I would still choose a Sunday of sardines myself. Uh, definitely. <laughs> and there's never been indifference to a Sunday as far as I'm concerned. But I get it. The permission, there is something about removing the taboo that I absolutely yeah. agree with. And she has this lovely idea that let's eat what the body, not the mind wants, but the mind has to interpret what the body wants. And it is this sense that we can get back to food, just being food. Well, yeah, it's I think that the, sometimes the the mind does want food and that's okay too. Like there's there is that there is a mental hunger and okay. Like that's all right. It doesn't to me it's too, it, there's a bit too much magical like that you, once you give yourself permission that you magically become in it's more of that the way the french eat, you know, like that that this is uh -huh. you just don't want it anymore. And like <laughs> you like my accent it wasn't french. <laughs> I think it takes away some of the complexity of food and, and its purpose and its joy. Mm -hmm. But you said, so if the mind wants food, the mind's hungry, that's absolutely okay. Yes, agreed. What if the mind is always hungry? Yeah. Doesn't seem to ever be able to be satisfied. Yeah. Go. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. So I think there's a simplistic nature of the way this is talked about as far as if you if you have permission for long enough, you stop wanting it. And I think that that's I think for some people that is true and that 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 is how it works. I think that to deny that there might be other layers going on when we consistently are, you know, when, when the mind is constantly talking and wanting food is um, remiss because I've I've had clients who have um, come to me saying, like, I've been doing this for two years and I just I keep waiting and I'm just binging every day. You know, and it's like, OK, OK, there's more layers that are potentially going on that it's not just about permission because I think that sometimes we have permission but there's other blocks going on that are keeping your mind asking and asking and there's so many different ways that that can show up maybe we can do an episode on all the different reasons for that um, but that I don't think it's it's an always a natural evolution and there's sometimes like a rerouting or, or a course correcting or an investigation of what else is going on there and someone could be patiently waiting for two years for something to shift that is and, and driving themselves into more of a hole um, because I think there's more, I think there's definitely more complexity to that to that. Mm -hmm. Another thing that Janine offers us is the eating guidelines and this is pre-intuitive eating and she has seven guidelines. Some of them have a bit of an overlap with intuitive eating. Some of them are slightly different. She often says that when she shows clients or people the eating guidelines, the response is normally, oh, crap. <laughs> it's like, these are things that a lot of us would struggle to do around food, even people who are not struggling with disordered eating. So I'll, shall I read them out and see what, yeah. let people see what they think? Number one. Eat when you're hungry. Number two, eat sitting down in a calm environment. This does not include the car. Whenever I read that second one, there's always a mum or somebody around that's got kids and noise and people around. And they'll say, I'd love to be able to sit down and eat in a calm environment, yeah. right? Yeah. So there is an element of privilege, I think, to some of these as well. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Number three. I, I, can I add that as yeah. a mom that I eat sometimes in the car and or... I eat with distractions and I, it's, it's not a deal breaker. Okay. Well, I didn't know that about you, Steph. I might have, <laughs> should have <laughs> asked before I started doing that. a podcast with you. Um, number three, eat without distractions. Distractions include radio, television, newspapers, books, intense or anxiety producing conversations or music. So this one with me, the eat without distractions. I, I make sure that I do this a few times a week. So my mm -hmm. lunch today, I just sat and ate my lunch. I mean, it's say without distractions, but quite often my mind's wandering and I'm thinking and plotting and planning. Yes. So I don't know that it's always the most mindful experience. And actually, as I was eating my lunch today, I had that feeling that even though I was really enjoying it, it was a really nice lunch. I had the thought, oh, eating is sometimes a chore. 
I used to feel that eating after recovery was supposed to always be this satisfying, enjoyable experience. And sometimes it's just not. Sometimes you just yeah. got to eat because you got to eat. It's time to eat. And I knew I was going to be recording all afternoon. Number four is to eat what your body wants, not your mind. It doesn't say that. <laughs> it does on one of the updated versions. On it the says worksheets. not your mind? Eat what your body, not oh. in brackets, not your mind wants, which is why oh. I added it in when I read it here. Mm. Mm. I disagree. Mm. Mm. That can't be uh, as a rule. Mm. Like that's an absolute. And I, I don't agree with that. Number five, eat until you are satisfied. I think satisfaction yeah. was always a big one for me. It's something I hold in mind when I'm yeah. making my food decisions. If I focus on satisfaction, I don't have to worry about the details so much. I tend to just move towards decisions that feel good to me. Number six, eat with the intention of being in full view of others. <laughs> oh, do we have different opinions? Because I think this is powerful. I think it is powerful. Oh, I okay. think it's but I also think it's really difficult because if you're going to, let's say you're in the throes of the binge and we've talked sometimes like the binge has got you and it's not letting you go until you've binged, you would never do that in front of other people. So oh, you're, you're kind mm -hmm. of in this conflict now, but the guideline says, you know, as if I'm in front of other people, but this overwhelming yes. urge to binge, I'm yes, fighting yes. with. Yes, okay. My take on it is, a, I guess I'm thinking more like eat without shame like mm -hmm. just slow it down and just be like, yes, I am. I am eating. That's more mm -hmm. of how I look at it because mm -hmm. secret of eating is such a big thing and not feeling like we have a right to eat food yeah. in front of other people. Like that's a bad thing. I think that challenging that is part of what I take from that. That's interesting because I take from it, if you wouldn't eat this way in front of other people, then you shouldn't eat that way. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's how I, when I first read Janine, that's what I took from it, but it's mm -hmm. not how I see it now I don't know how she means it probably probably the first way <laughs> no, um, maybe the second let's be generous okay fine number seven is eat with enjoyment gusto and pleasure I love that word gusto yeah. doesn't get used um, enough I don't think I eat with gusto very much well sometimes sometimes but uh guidelines okay she's not saying it's rules I don't know mm -hmm. I think sometimes it's more bland than that but I think it's good practice to find your enjoyment through food and a, yeah. you know just pepper it in there yeah um i also just need to say real quick about number one eat when you're hungry that that's one of those other ones you can interpret two ways e i definitely eat when i'm hungry when i'm hungry i eat mm -hmm. but i don't only eat when i'm hungry you know there's mm -hmm. two ways of looking at that too because yeah. i think that used to be more of that hunger fullness diet or yeah. hunger diet i think i certainly saw it as only eat when you're hungry only eat when you're hungry mm -hmm. yeah and also make sure you do eat when you're hungry, both. But again, it's that hungerfulness, dare I say, yep. diet. <laughs> but all in all, I mean, Janine has been hugely influential. I've seen her speak and you can hear a pin drop in the crowd. She's very powerful um, at her speaking and has certainly has certainly shaped my relationship with food, um, despite the divergent yeah. theories there. And I also want to say that with anybody out there talking about this stuff, including me and Steph, take what works for you, take what resonates, what makes sense to you and discard the rest. We're never gonna be able to say things that always resonate with you. There'll be times when we'll say things that won't apply or that just won't be your experience because this is such a broad, mm. diverse experience. Our relationship with food is so mm. intimate and personal and varies so much from person to person. Yeah, that's um, funny you say that, and then we will pop off. But sometimes when I edit these and I listen to what I've said, I'm like, but wait, you didn't clarify. Like, there's parts where I start to disagree with what I'm saying, mm -hmm. or I have a or I have a point to make, or I protest something that I've said. And I think that just does speak to that. It's that there's there's so many conversations within our own statements, and yeah, it's hard yeah. to yeah. And certainly for me, I wanted to find someone that had all the answers that could tell me what to do and how to yeah. get myself out of this mess. And I don't think that that exists. We get little bits from here and there. And I'm extremely grateful to Janine for her contribution to the world. So. Yeah. Done. Okay. We'll see you next time. Uh, ratings. Do you want to tell people to rate? If you can give, pop, give us a rating, that would be fantastic. And a review. A, re a review with... 
Yeah. By the time this goes out, we might even have a website. Check below and find oh, out. Oh, we'll be talking about that. Ooh. All right. Okay. Thanks, Janine. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. Steph. Thanks, Janine. Thanks, everybody. Bye.